Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back um, to our next session, our first session for this afternoon, which will give us a really important opportunity to look in detail at the Trade Facil Facilitation Agreement. It was agreed last year and, and is really a landmark moment in, in trade and, and in agreements. Um, this agreement is expected to reduce the time needed to import goods and to help new firms export for the first time. LDCs are expected to benefit from this, treat, this agreement, and yet they will also need some support, including technical assistance and cap capacity development, to enable them to get the full benefits that the, that the agreement holds. Your moderator for this session is Ms. Sherry Rose now. Um, she's the councillor at the World Trade Organization, so please make her very welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you here today, which to a session that promises to be very rich and informative on trade facilitation and what it means for LDCs. So in addition to everyone here in the room, we are live streaming on Facebook. So welcome to any, everybody tuning in from around the world. And as I'm sure you all know, the trade facilitation agreement entered into force last year, February 2017. So WTO members are now working on implementing its provisions and on finding support to help them implement it. So this is a very good time to explore what the TFA, the Trade Facilitation Agreement, means for LDCs, why it's beneficial, why some countries are hesitating, and how to leverage the necessary support. So before we explore all these topics, we will set the scene with a, a very quick state of play on the Trade Facilitation Agreement on the ratifications and notifications. And then we'll take a look at trades, trade trends and flows and opportunities. We have speakers from government, private sector, development par partners in Asia and Africa. Um, but before we begin, uh, just a couple administrative issues. Uh, we'll ask our speakers to keep it to under 10 minutes uh, in order to allow time for questions at the end. And with the permission of speakers, we will put all the PowerPoint presentations on our trade facilitation website so you don't have to take photos. We'll make them available to you. And also, we're live streaming and recording this. We hope to put the session on our website. So if you ask a question at the end, just don't say anything you don't want your boss, spouse, or anyone else to know about. Um, so let's begin by finding out who these people are with me on the stage. Um, full bios are available on the uh, LDC Global Forum website. And before each person speaks, I'll give you a little bit of highlight from their bio, but I'll tell you who they are right now. First, we have Carlos Grau Tanner from the Global Express Association. Then we have Stephen Pope from DHL. Dr. Jan Duval from UNSCAP. Uh, Richard Kamadjugo from Trademark East Africa and Lillian Boalia from uh, Zambia, from the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, and Industry. So actually, I will start off the session uh, with a state of play on the Trade Facilitation Agreement. So, so to, as of now, as of today, 136 WTO members have ratified the agreement. And this slide shows the least developed countries that have already ratified it. So there are 27 WTO members that have not yet ratified, and of these 27, 14 are LDCs. Now I'm sure everyone in the room knows what ABC category means, but I'll give a brief reminder just in case. So each WTO member, each developing and least developed member, can decide when they will implement each of the approximately 38 provisions of the Trade Facilitation Agreement. And in order to take advantage of these flexibilities, there are a series of notifications that must be made to the other WTO members. And the first notifications are category A, B, and C. 
So each country must put each of these provisions of the agreement into one of these three categories. Category A are the measures the country is already implementing. Category B are the measures for which the member needs more time to implement. And category C are the measures for which a member needs time and some technical assistance. So this slide shows the overall uh, notifications for developing and least developed countries. There are 113 uh, members that have notified in category A. We've received 67 category B notifications and 56 in category C. Now one reason for the difference between B and C is some members put everything in A and B so they won't have anything in C. Now, this slide shows the 27 LDCs that have notified in category A. So out of 113 overall, 27 are from LDC countries. And the column next to the country name shows the percent of the provisions of the agreement that that country has put in category A. So the, the highest percent is 66, and that is Mali. And the next highest is Cambodia, and they put 61% of the provisions in, in category A. Now, there are um, nine LDCs that have not yet provided any notifications, no A, Bs, or Cs. Okay. So this slide shows the 21 LDC members that have already provided their category B and C notifications. And you can also see in the columns the percentages in <coughs> B and C. And my slides will be on the website if you want to study them in more detail. Plus, all of these um, statistics come from the TFA database. Um, that and a whole lot of other statistics can be found there. Okay. So this slide shows the percent of all the TFA notifications in A, B, and C. So the green represents Category A notifications. So right now, uh, looking at the Category A's from developing and least developed countries, 47% of the trade facilitation agreement is already being um, implemented. Now, if you add in the developed countries who are already implementing in full, uh, the agreement is being implemented 60%. 60% of the agreement is being implemented already around the world. Now, the Category B provisions are, represent 11%. That's the blue. And the red is Category C, so 15% of the agreement is in Category C. And the gray is not yet notified, so 27% of the agreement has not been put in um, any of these three categories yet. And this slide has the exact same statistics. Green is A, blue is B, red is C, but divided up by regions of the world. So Africa is the top line, Asia Pacific is the next line, and since that's where most of the LDCs are, uh, I'll stop there and going down the list. Again, this is available online. And this is just a snapshot from Togo. This is from their notification. And they are an LDC. And I use this just to say that LDCs do not yet have to provide the indicative dates, the dates of when they will implement the agreement. And they have more of time for the definitive dates and the technical assistance and support for capacity building. And I'm often asked, well, can we notify these things before the deadline? And absolutely. The deadline is the latest date. Uh, several LDCs are already providing all this information and having the technical assistance and support capacity building needs is very useful for working with donors. So uh, absolutely, any, it can all be notified now. There are also other um, transparency provisions that are um, throughout the trade facilitation agreement, such as um, you know, uh, the inquiry point um, information, the HRL or URL site for the internet publication. Um, and if you uh, want to have more information in one handy form on all of the notifications throughout the trade facilitation agreement, uh, this is a, a picture of our brochure that's available at our table in the atrium. So that will give you more information as well as our websites. So thank you for that. But now we will move on to our next speaker, Mr. Carlos Grautaner. And Carlos is the Director General of the Global Express Association. And this association represents the three leading express delivery carriers, DHL Express, FedEx TNT, and UPS. And together they do business in 220 countries and territories. And they, lucky for us, collect statistics worldwide. 
So Carlos is based here in Geneva, and he's well known in the trait facilitation community for many reasons, but including his very interesting presentations on trade statistics, trade flows, and trade opportunities. So we're pleased he's here to today make this presentation for us. So Carlos. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sherry, and, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here and for the kind introduction. Uh, as Sherry said, our association represents the three leading express delivery carriers, those three companies. One of them is to my left, so I'm under strict surveillance from one of my members today. Um, and what they do is run a global network uh, and transportation network. Their business is to carry documents and goods in a very fast, very secure and time-definite way from virtually any doorstep on the planet to any other doorstep on the planet. So basically it's a logistics link to the world. We do collect statistics. Uh, the ones I'm going to show you today are from a study that we carried out three years ago. So they're not the most recent ones granted, but but uh, they are still relevant in, in, in the big uh, scheme of things, and certainly the conclusions of the study remain highly relevant. One of the things we looked at back then was, uh, and that's just a snapshot, um, what is the share of international express items by region? As, and as you can see predictably, in some regions, the total share compared to the, to, to the globe is small, but there are surprises. Uh, first of all, look at, for instance, where the flows go. Uh, if you look at uh, Africa and the Middle East, uh, the, the middle column, the middle pillar, you will see that exports go fairly evenly to all other regions. And uh, there's a reason why we need to remain at a very high aggregate level, which is uh, competition law, so we cannot, unfortunately, drill down to minute detail. But the big picture of things shows you that exports are there and they're going all over the world. Um, Latin America, for instance, has perhaps more of a regional concentration, but um, in, in the case of Africa and the Middle East, it's, it's very clear that exports go uh, very evenly all over the planet. That is perhaps the most interesting finding of that study, and that remains relevant today. We looked at where growth is, and remember those were the post-financial crisis years, and we expect to see very little growth, but we saw that the top five interregional flows, so region to region, were what um, people in this house would call south-south and south-north trade lanes. Uh, the, w, uh, the WCO has, sorry, WTO has been saying for, for a number of years that trade today is evenly spread in north-north, north-south and south-south, and indeed that's what our study indicated. But even more interestingly, it showed that the biggest growth is in those channels, south-south and south-north. Look, for instance, at the growth experience in those years between Africa and Latin America. It doubled. It's double figures everywhere. Same here, the study, and you can, you can uh, download it from our website, back then showed that from Africa and the Middle East to the rest of the world, you would have double-digit growth figures across the panel. So tremendous growth in, in those regions. But this panel is about trade facilitation and the impact of the trade facilitation agreement. And the study also looked at that, and we do constantly. Uh, we asked a consultancy in London, Frontier Economics, to build an index for us from statistics and data that we collect every year in a database that looks at what we call customs capability. If you will, the efficiency of border administrations. How fast and efficient is it to get board, uh, goods across borders worldwide, country by country, and we look at 140 countries. They picked 10 elements and rated uh, each country from 0 to 10, depending on how they did in these elements. And these elements actually are very, very similar to things you find in the trade facilitation agreement. I, I'm sure Steve will speak to that in more detail next. But is it things such as, is there transparency? Do you publish your regulations? If you don't, you get a zero. If you do some but not all, then you get 0.5. And if you do it fully, you get one point. So you can score a maximum of 10. Now, where are countries around the world? 
as you can see, very evenly spread, but most of them are in the middle. And there are many that are lagging behind. Look at the ones that score one, and how very few actually score a 10 or a 9 or a 9.5. So this tells us that there is tremendous room for improvement when it comes to trade facilitation around the world. And the trade facilitation agreement is a key instrument to get there, to move all those pillars to the other side, to the end side, to, to make sure that people get to the top scores. Now, what happens, and we asked Frontier Economics, what happens if a country increases its score by one point? So, say you didn't have 24-7 customs operations and then you do it. Well, they looked at that and they came up with an astonishing figure. They said if a country improves its score by one point, the total trade, imports, exports, in all transport modes, this is not about express delivery, it's about any form of trade, any mode of transport. You can expect growth of 4.4%. Of course, this is massive. It's not something you switch on and happens overnight, but it's something that you can expect in the medium term. The other thing they said was that this is a linear figure. So if you increase by two points, and that, again, is a result of implementing the trade facilitation agreement, you can expect a growth of 8.8% over time, and so on. We challenged them, said, we, you must be exaggerating, that's way too good. And they peer-reviewed the study, and all the reviews came up certifying that that finding was correct. And it, in fact, it's in line with what the OECD and, and, and other studies, uh, Peterson Institute and others, have found. So there is a clear link between trade facilitation and trade growth and development. Now, um, I have two minutes and 26 seconds left. Communications experts say that in 10 minutes you can say three things. Well, I'll try to say two. Um, and the conclusions are, from our experience, from our study, that we're seeing the biggest growth in demand for our services in south-south and south-north trade lanes. The second conclusion is that if you implement the TFA fully, you can expect that growth to be boosted tremendously. So my question is, what's not to like about it? And I'll stop here, and uh, as a representative of the express delivery industry, I think I did that on time. <laughs> as always, thank you. thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's always good not only to see the trade flows, but where the trade opportunities are. And I think the timing of your study is actually perfect, because that was the same year that the agreement, the negotiations on the trade facilitation agreement were concluded. So it'll be a good baseline to look a few years from now to see how things have changed and uh, to see if these statistics keep improving. So now we'll move over next to uh, Mr. Stephen Pope. Uh, Stephen works for DHL Express Europe, where he's responsible for customs regulatory affairs, trade compliance, and trade facilitation. And he's also on the steering group of the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation. I'm sure many of you in the room have heard about uh, the Global Alliance. I think um, even Sean sat here and spoke this morning. Uh, it is a public-private partnership that helps WTO members ratify and implement the trade facilitation agreement. And if you want more information, not to keep pushing our uh, booth in the atrium, but we have brochures on the Global Alliance, so you can either talk to Stephen or you can go out and, and pick up a, a brochure. So Stephen, DHL does business in so many countries, all levels of development, those that are already vested greatly facilitating trade and those that still have high costs and burdensome procedures. Could you explain how LDCs can benefit from facilitating trade and how implementation of the trade facilitation agreement can empower the micro, small, and medium enterprises in their countries? So, thanks, Sherry, and uh, I'll see if I can uh, keep within the time and uh, you know, make it. Uh, okay, that's very kind of you. So. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, um, particularly with such an important um, uh, event as this. So, firstly, what is the TFA? And in short, it's a set of best principles that are common sense. You know, publishing your legislation and guidance online um, with limited amount of resources, having a risk-based approach to controls, um, and engaging, for example, with, with your stakeholders, which are you know, the private sector, your traders that you want to export. The other thing is it offers certainty, and that is key, particularly 
NNDC and LDC, if you've got a small to medium enterprise, you've got an entrepreneur who's looking to trade internationally, they need certainty. And being able to get on the internet and being able to see the guidance on uh, whoever, whichever country they're targeting, what can be expected offers them a lot of certainty, particularly around also what their expectations can be, because the TFA includes things around costs on fines, um, charges, etc. So it gives, a, it gives an SME a much stable base to start from. Um, Public-private engagement, it, it does help develop um, better policies. Now, I was pre in a previous life, I was a policy official. And I think, you know, as you've heard from Sherry, we're members of the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation. At the end of the day, it's, you know, the best way to develop policy is understanding exactly the environment that you're in. And in the area of trade, it's businesses that do the trade. And we're talking about the, the official, if you want to create policy that's fit for purpose, you know, to learn from your stakeholders, your businesses, what the impact may well be on the policies that you want to implement. It's about removing bureaucratic barriers to trade as well, and I briefly mentioned about a risk-based deterrence to control. At the end of the day, if you've got legitimate business, it's the same container that every week, where you came, week out, same goods, they're paying the taxes on time, you know exactly who they are, you don't need to waste resources and you don't need to raise cost on controlling those. It's the non-compliance within the supply chain that you want to target. So, and of course, the background of that is, of course, that you get a reduced cost of business and government. Governments can, can basically target their customs and regulatory resources better on more um, specific risk areas for them. And of course, legitimate business can have the certainty that they can get across the border as quickly as possible. And I think the great thing about the TFA is it is a global piece of legislation uh, on best practice. It means that everybody can expect the same. If we all implement the TFA, as intended, it means there is a level playing for everyone across the board. And I think for um, you in LDCs and DCs, yes, there's a lot of emphasis on and imports, um, but for us in DHL and within the Global Express Association, with the Global Alliance as well, there's a huge emphasis, it's about exports. You want to get income coming in. So what you want to ensure is that basically your partner countries are implementing the TFA resort reforms if you have SMEs that can target major economies with their goods, they want to be able to make sure that they can get there. And this is what this is about with the level playing field. And the TFA and e-commerce. The TFA is a wonderful piece of legislation. And, and it, the timing couldn't be better with the, with the growth in e-commerce. E-commerce has been around for a while. E-commerce is not a new phenomenon. It's a paradigm shift in trade, nothing else but it offers something for, an, for a, um, a micro, small, or medium enterprise that, no, that has never been available before. If you're out there, if you've got your businesses in LDCs and LDCs, their customers have been whoever's gone past their stall or their shop or have been in the town or the village. Now you can have a great idea as an SME and a de least developed or developing economy, you can basically, you can access the global market immediately. And with the TFA as well, the certainty of the TFA, the window on the world that e-commerce offers, it couldn't be a better time for LDCs and DCs. So what are the risks around it? Well, the first one is, of course, implementation. It's great ratifying it, but you need to implement. And the other great thing about, about the, the TFA is, is, is around assistance, capacity building. The A, B, and C commitments that you have there the help is out there, the guidance is out there. And that's part of the role that we play within the, within the Global Alliance as well. And the other risk as well is the lack of engagement with the private sector. It's not always easy engaging with the private sector. I know that I was previously in the, the UK government uh, and we were involved in consultations with the private sector on, on various policies that we were trying to implement. And particularly if you've come from an environment where the private sector has never really been willing to engage or you've had a difficulty engage, it's something new. But again, you can take guidance on that. And, and we we're, we're certainly, with the Global Express Association and with the Global Alliance and with the support of the WTO, um, are there to work with you through that. Because once you do engage with the private sector, you get them close. A, you'll get better policies, but B, you'll also understand if you've got an honest partner or not. As soon as they're close, you know if they really have honest intent or not. 
The other great risk, of course, and I'm not going to dwell on that at the moment, uh, is protectionism. Um, we're in a bit of a, um, an unusual situation at the moment, um, but at the end of the day, I think the key thing is, particularly for LDCs and DCs, and in general, is implement the TFA. Just keep going, keep driving, and keep pushing. I mentioned about the advantages of e-commerce, uh, and it's sometimes seen as friend and sometimes seen as foe. You know, we, we also, Carlos and I, engage as well uh, with customs administrations, and we, we engage with the World Customs Organization. You know, customs are there to protect the borders. We get that, we understand that. There are challenges around, around taxation. But what we also need to do is there is a lot of focus on the risks within e-commerce, but what we need to do is we need to bring the balance up in terms of e-commerce, in terms of the opportunities. Yes, there are risks in terms of um, tax collection. There may be issues around smuggling and counterfeit, etc. But the vast majority of businesses that will use e-commerce want to use it for legitimate purposes. And we need to make sure that we maximize that effort, particularly for SMEs. And it's understanding that shift in trade. You know, there are a number of examples out there, particularly within developed economies, on the taxation of e-commerce, on controls on e-commerce, but I, we still are not 100% sure about what the environment looks like that we're operating in. And as a policy official, it's very often, if you see a potential risk, of course you want to legislate or regulate, but you've got to understand what you're legislating for and what you're regulating. And that goes back to the National Trade Facilitation Committees, but overall, understanding the environment that we're working in. The MTFCs are a brilliant idea, um, and they will help going forward. And of course, with globally harmonized policies, you know, a, around e-commerce, around trade in general, one of the most important factors is, if a, if a national government decides that it wants to regulate in one area, it forgets that there are you know, 200 other plus countries and territories that may have the same idea. And if you end up with 200 plus different policies and different regulatory frameworks in every other country, it makes it impossible. So that is also key, and we are pushing continuously on harmonization. But I think in summary, the key is implementation is key. You, know, at the, you ratify, great, tick the box. The ABC committees, commitments tick the box. If you need assistance, that assistance is available, but by all means, please implement. Engage with your stakeholders. National Trade Facilitation Committees set them up. E-commerce, as I've said, is an engine for growth, particularly for your SMEs. You can now trade globally from anywhere in the world. Exports are key. That's what you want to do. Drive your SMEs. And above all, beyond, I think as a finalist, we do need a rule-based system for global trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, you raised some very interesting points. I, I know many members in the room, some members here are looking at how trade facilitation agreement can be implemented to support the small, medium enterprise, or MISMEs as we call them here, micro, small, and medium enterprises, and also looking at trade facilitation and e-commerce. But uh, many members are also struggling with the national committees and working with the private sector and keeping the private sector on board with the, the national committees. And I like that, you know, one issue that results from private sector being involved with implementation is building of trust between governments and traders, but I never thought about the being able to judge who is trustworthy. So that was a, an interesting <laughs> additional point. Um, so thank you very much for that. And uh, because the majority of LDC countries are located in either Asia or Africa, we will now look at trade facilitation in each of these regions, and we will start with Asia. So our next speaker is Dr. Jan Duval. He is the Chief of the Trade Policy and Facilitation Section of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asian Pacific, much easier just to say ESCAP. Um, Jan, has conducted <laughs> Jan has conducted many research projects related to trade facilitation in his 15 years in this post. He also delivers technical assistance and advisory services on trade policy and facilitation throughout Asia and the Pacific. He has spearheaded ArtNet, probably many of you have heard of ArtNet, uh, the Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade, the ESCAP World Bank Trade Cost Database, and Jan, can you tell us about the findings of your recent survey on trade facilitation and paperless trade implementation in Asia? And could you provide some highlights of your findings that could be useful for LDCs around the world? 
Thank you, Sherry. Uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, so I have three extra minutes, right? Because everybody saved one or two minutes. So, uh, but uh, so let me go ahead uh, quickly. Um, so uh, about this, uh, the survey uh, you asked me to, to present. Um, uh, so we conduct uh, now for the past, uh, that's the second time, so for the past uh, four, three years, uh, the UN Global Survey on Trade Facilitation and Paperless Trade Implementation. So the last time we conducted it was, uh, was last year. Um, so this very much relates to the Trade Facilitation Agreement, but it's not entirely mapped uh, to the TFA. Uh, so that's why I wanted to start by showing you the coverage of the, of the Global Survey. Uh, and and uh, so we have 38 trade facilitation measures uh, in four different groups. Uh, as you can see, what we call general trade facilitation measures is actually all the TFA related measures because as the previous speaker mentioned, I mean, this is common sense stuff. This is like the basic set of measures that, that really uh, you need to, to go and implement. Um, and then there is transit facilitation in the coverage, but we focus quite a bit on what we call now digital trade facilitation measures, right? paperless trade measures and cross-border paperless trade measures, right? So um, what's a little bit less known possibly is this idea of cross-border paperless trade. So a good example of cross-border paperless trade is actually the exchange of electronic certificates of origin between countries, right? And we see this as a next generation type of trade facilitation, electronic exchange of uh, data and documents across borders with legal recognition uh, of the documents, right? And that's something that is not, that is slow to happen. Uh, in the survey, we also add a number of measures related to actually the sustainable development goals uh, and sustainable development. So now we focus a little bit on trade facilitation for SMEs, uh, agricultural trade facilitation, and also women participation in trade facilitation. So that's, uh, that was the scope of the survey. Uh, we have about 120 countries, uh, data for about 120 countries, and so it's led by SCAP uh, from Asia and the Pacific, but it's organized and it's done by all the UN regional commissions, uh, the other four UN, uh, UN regional commissions across the world. That's why we can do a, a global work. Uh, if you want to know what, uh, how your country is doing, and uh, you, can, you can go online and we have a, a database where you can, you can find the implementation uh, uh, rates of the different countries, different groups of countries. Uh, but here looking specifically at uh, Asia-Pacific LDCs, least developed countries, right? Well, globally, I think the, the implementation rate of all the measures we have in the survey is around 50%. Right, and Asia Pacific is about 50% implementation rate. Uh, LDCs in Asia and the Pacific are way below this. We are at 34 to 36%. Uh, 36%. Landlocked countries, just for reference, are a bit higher, uh, have higher implementation, and small island developing states actually are, are way behind, also like nearly at 25, 26% implementation rate. Uh, but so uh, definitely a lot of room for improvement on uh, implementation of trade facilitation and, and paperless trade. Uh, this goes into a little bit more detail about uh, the types of measures that are more, more implemented or less implemented. Transparency measures, formalities, institutional arrangements and cooperation, those are all measures that you find in the, the TFA. Uh, and those are relatively well implemented, although obviously, I mean, not fully. But uh, digital trade facilitation, paperless trade, cross-border paperless trade, uh, not surprisingly, uh, are way, way behind. Eh? Uh, if you look, uh, referring specifically to WTO TFA, right? Uh, according to the survey, the, here I'm showing the five least implemented uh, measures uh, for Asia Pacific uh, LDCs. And so that includes establishment and publication of average release time. So actually, it's about monitoring trade facilitation performance. So that's kind of concern. Advanced ruling is also not very well implemented. Uh, electronic payment of custom duties and fees. Electronic single window system, this is not surprising, it's probably the most advanced measure in the whole uh, TFA. Uh, and then trade facilitation measures for authorized operators, right? Those are the five uh, least implemented. So there is uh, scope to work and focus on those. Now, what are the expected gains from WTO TFA implementation in Asia and the Pacific? Uh, so, I mean, we've done a lot of studies, and, and then, yes, always the numbers are very impressive. In fact, we, we have to double check the numbers every time because it's like, wow, I mean, that's really good gains, right? On trade, on trade cost. Um, and so, uh, but then the recent things, uh, estimates we've, uh, and analysis we've done, reveal two things. I mean, the first, that the trade cost reductions almost double if you go for full implementation of both binding 
and non-binding measures uh, in the TFA. So uh, that's, that's, a big, uh, that's a big thing. Only 5% reduction in trade cost if you just barely comply with the TFA. 10% reduction in trade cost if you, if you go for full compliance, right? And you do, you do your best implementing it. The second thing uh, we find is uh, ICT applications uh, in trade facilitation. So here again, we go back to paperless trade uh, measures have high trade cost reduction potentials. You add another 7% uh, to, uh, to what you could achieve uh, if you implement the TFA uh, thinking about digital implementation, but, you know, I mean, just uh, not, not necessarily going digital, right? Uh, so there is uh, use of ICT in implementing transaction is really a, a must uh, going forward. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, what, I, what I've mentioned, uh, I, th I, th um, I think you have to put some of the things I mentioned uh, in, into perspective. Um, I look at the Asia-Pacific region, and the Asia-Pacific region is quite advanced. Uh, in terms of trade facilitation, has been very proactive in trade facilitation over the years. So actually, in many countries are, are, uh, are really going beyond some of the trade facilitation agreement measures implementation already. Uh, if you look, go, go back at the history, look at the history, Singapore and Hong Kong, China, single windows, we are basically among the, or the first single windows to be implemented almost 30 years ago now, right? Um, uh, ASEAN single window agreement was signed in 2005. For those of you who are not familiar with the ASEAN Single Window Agreement, it's not, it's about interconnecting and electronic uh, uh, national single windows, right? And this is 2005, right, when they signed that thing. So that's, that's many years ago. Uh, and they've made good progress, uh, especially in the recent months on this, right? And then in Asia Pacific, uh, and I think that's very, uh, something to look at for other parts of the world, um, we also have now, uh, the countries have negotiated a UN treaty to promote uh, and facilitate cross-border paperless trade uh, among themselves, right? Uh, that treaty is called the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, about 24 uh, countries, so half of our membership in ESCAP actively engaged uh, in, in preparing the, in developing the, the, the instrument and uh, is now preparing implementation roadmap for, uh, um, uh, towards cross-border paperless trade. Uh, and so the idea of this, uh, of this framework agreement is really to support uh, the full digital implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement, as well as, and that's something that is important in our region, but I think also in other regions. Now, a lot of regional trade agreements uh, include paperless trading provisions, uh, and a lot of them are not implemented, right? So that can also um, uh, help implement some of the relevant provision, trade fashion provision in bilateral and sub-regional agreements. So just to give you an idea of what's going on in, in the Asia-Pacific a little bit in terms of digital trade facilitation. Uh, in terms of conclusion and way forward, uh, so actually this is probably my most interesting slide, uh, at least from my perspective. <laughs> I only have one minute to cover it. Uh, I mean, the, the survey is fine, right? It's good to do global surveys and, and to come up with indicators. But actually, if you really want to know what's going on, you have to go at the, uh, uh, at the, at the micro level, uh, really look at the procedures maybe at the product level and things like that, right? So in ESCAP, as part of our capacity building work, including with the Asian Development Bank, we actually do this. We conduct business process analysis uh, for trade facilitation in specific countries for specific products and along specific corridors, right? And so some of the things I'm, I'm putting in my conclusions are really about uh, relates to more of that micro level work. Uh, so let me run down quickly through the, the points, right? First, related to WTO TFA, I mean, clearly it's a new global trade facilitation baseline. So not implementing it is that's taking the, any country who doesn't do this out of the game, right? The global trade game, right? So that's, that's it's, it provides a very clear roadmap. I mean, it's not, not complicated. I mean, you've got a list of provisions uh, to implement. Uh, so that's a nice thing to follow. Uh, again, based on our uh, results, striving to, for full and digital implementation of the WTO TFA is really the way forward. Uh, in terms of recommendations uh, from, again, some of the work we've done in the countries, uh, it would be important to use the national trade facilitation committees to address trade facilitation in a holistic manner. Uh, so what that means is that under WTO TFA, you have to establish a national trade facilitation committee. Uh, but, uh, but just uh, giving uh, to the name TFC just the role of implementing the TFA uh, may not be uh, the, the proper approach, because at the end of the day, what you want to do is reduce trade cost. And to do this, you have to look at the entire 
set of procedures, commercial procedures, transport procedures, uh, regulatory procedures, uh, even payment procedures, right? And see where are the bottlenecks and implement. So it's good to give a little bit broader mandate than just the TFA to the DMTFCs. Um, strengthening public-private sector collaboration. Uh, I think uh, no need to dwell on this because we had two uh, private sector speakers before. But what we find in our country is it's sometime uh, private sector, engaging the private sector is not, uh, is not done properly or not done at all. There is some reluctance. Um, and so, uh, but this needs to be done through NTFCs and through other things because private sector knows. They are the one who know where the problems are, not the government officials, unfortunately. Right? Um, considering cross-border electronic exchange of data and documents when developing national systems, this is all realize uh, a lot of countries are spending massive amount of money and efforts developing national single windows, interlinking their traders uh, with their regulatory authorities. But at the end of the day, if you want to achieve seamless trade facilitation, I mean, it's a cross-border process, right? So they spend your money when you develop the national single windows on making sure that you can electronically exchange the content of the single window with the key partner countries and uh, uh, outside, right? And that's what ASEAN has, has been trying to do, actually. Um, uh, three more things. Sorry, I'm uh, taking uh, one more minute. Prioritize capacity building for other government agencies. Another thing we found is a lot of the attention goes to customs authorities. Actually, customs are the ones who are the most advanced in the game of trade facilitation. Uh, but looks at uh, agricultural ministries, uh, you know, food safety regulators, they don't have capacity. And so there is a need to look at some of those. Um, and then uh, set ambitious goals. This is a good lessons learned, I think, from the Asia-Pacific region and ASEAN in particular. Uh, I mentioned the ASEAN single window agreement. This was very ambitious when this was set, like first thing, first, uh, very, very first cross-border paperless trade initiative, uh, regional single window initiative in the world. And so what, right now we are, what, 15 years later, it hasn't been implemented fully as expected, but ASEAN is a region that has the most largest number of national single windows in place. So even if you put your, you're very ambitious in terms of setting your goals, I mean, that will help you improve even if you don't completely achieve your goals. Um, last point uh, is closely monitoring, uh, the need to closely monitor implementation uh, and performance. Um, and so, because uh, in a way it's easy to say, oh, I've implemented the TFA, okay? But that's what you need to do, what, 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 what needs to be achieved as at the end of the day is a real effective reduction in trade cost. So I think there is a need to, uh, to monitor uh, not only the implementation of a particular measure, but also whether that, that implementation results in reduction in trade cost or not. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. And I believe the same study was done by the UN offices in each region of the world. Isn't that correct? Or most of them? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, the data uh, is done, uh, it covers 120 uh, countries and okay. all the regional commissions around the world have participated. Uh, so we have reports at the global level, at the regional level, at the sub-regional level. Um, and in fact, on demand, we can produce almost anything you wish I mean, for any <laughs> group of country. Right? Okay. okay, thank you very much. And if we don't already have all these studies on our website, we will, we will make sure we do because they were very, very interesting. And um, after I saw your slide of the five um, measures in the trade facilitation agreement that are least implemented by LDCs in Asia, I took a quick look at our ABC um, notification statistics to see how the LDCs in Africa would compare. So of the three, three provisions are the same. Uh, that is advanced ruling, single window, and authorized operators. But in the African LDCs, the other top two provisions not being implemented or least implemented, not in category A, um, are internet publication and border agency cooperation. So some are the same and, uh, and some a little bit different. So our next speaker can provide us with more information on the situation in, in East Africa. So I'd now like to introduce Mr. Richard Kamajugo. He's the Senior Director of Trade Environment at Trademark East Africa. And in his job, he focuses on improving trade systems, legal and trade policy issues, and reducing trade barriers in the East African community. He has also worked at the Ministry of Commerce in Uganda, and he was the Commissioner of Customs, where he oversaw implementation of reforms and trade facilitation initiatives. So Richard, um, Trademark, I believe, works in seven countries in East Africa, of which six are LDCs. 
So could you tell us about your experience working in the East African LDC countries? What are some of the challenges, successes, and what needs to be done to sustain the successes achieved so far? Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just a brief note about Trademark East Africa. This is not the trademark talking about intellectual property rights. It's trade and markets. So we play two roles, growing trade, growing markets. That's our focus. Trademark is supported by eight development partners. That's the strip you see at the bottom. The UK, uh, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, Norway, and the US government. So, we've heard so much about the Trade Facilitation Agreement. What does it do, really, in brief? The highlights here, we're talking about border agency cooperation. And I think I would like to emphasize here, because Trademark works very closely with the governments in East Africa to implement trade facilitation measures. What we'd like to emphasize here is that border agency cooperation many times leaves out the police. What we've done in East Africa is to incorporate the police within the trade facilitation agenda. And what we realized was that police, besides security, now is counted among the trade facilitation agencies. And that really brought a big change in terms of the perception and the actions that the police uh, the police was taking. Accessing information, availing information to the public, consultation between the public and private sector, that's what everyone has talked about here, simplifying trade procedures, harmonizing regulations. It's very common in many places that you get to, like axolot limits, for example, that you have a truck moving from point A in one country to point B in another. And yet then the axle load limits are not harmonized. So at the border, you're either penalized or you have to reduce or offload some of the cargo, which is already paid for and has to be delivered. So that's the challenge that you find. And then using ICT as a tool towards achieving that framework that we're looking at here. So when fully implemented, the TFA is projected to lead 14.5% reduction in costs. We are also told that it will increase exports of between 14 and 18. But the question there would be 14.5%. There are some big industries globally which are not 14.5% of the economies. So clearly, inefficiency that, reduce, that, that leads to reduction of costs of 14.5%. It's a big industry. Inefficiency is an industry. So this is not just a party that you're going to implement the trade facilitation agreement. You are disorganizing, you are distorting a whole industry. What do we see the main challenges in the movement of goods in LDCs? I just read one of the books here I got from the Otrium. And it says, there's a sentence, that in one landlocked African country, 43% of truck transport time is spent moving. Less than 50% of the total time is spent doing the truck, instead of doing the core business, it spends only 43%. The rest is spent on roadblocks, at the borders, and the drivers are resting. So who pays the cost of that rest? It's the consumer, the owner of the goods, who then transfers the cost to the consumer. So what challenges, the main ones do we find? Multiple roadblocks for goods in transit, disparate regulations, which I've already talked about, administrative regulations, inefficient port and border post operations, you have duplicative procedures, you have very inefficient way bridges where you have three way bridges along the way, but then each of the three gives you a different weight. So what do you do in that case? You have manual processes, 
multiple and standalone procedures and systems of different agencies. So agency coordination is limited. So what do we find? The developments in the ESC, we've had lots of improvements and interface of national custom systems. I think Jan was talking about national, national, national. So these have been upgraded nationally and interfaced regionally so that then you have that seamless exchange of information along the way. Implementation of the authorized economic operator scheme. This is in accordance, uh, Article 7, I think, of the TFA provides for this. You have automation of the trade processes of regular trade agencies. Again, Ian alluded to that, that we used to talk about clearance time and clearance was synonymous with customs clearance. But then the business kept complaining that things are not, are not working, only to realize that by the time you get to customs, you have so many other permits that you need. And that process takes you 10 days, takes you two weeks. So once you get the permit after 10 days, you come to customs and take two hours. And then we start celebrating that clearance is taking two hours. But for the business, it's taking two weeks. So the intervention here was to help and automate the processes of those other agencies so that then they are able to exchange information seamlessly with the customs. And the business is able to apply online and get all this. Implementation of electronic single windows, Article 10, we've had this implementation. Um, regional electronic cargo tracking. We had national electronic cargo tracking systems. So these have been linked. And I think the WCO mentioned that East Africa could be the only region in the world that is where governments, where customs is tracking goods regionally. Private sector voice in OSBP operations, the one-stop border post operations, the structure is that there is a committee that meets regularly to discuss issues. And here it's mandatory that in every joint border committee, there must be a representative of women traders. Because what used to happen is that all would be there, cross-border traders, and they would all be men. And yet, 80% of cross-border traders are women. So there has to be a woman on that joint border committee. Cross-border um, coordinated border management procedures, access to information, trade portals have been established. In Rwanda, it's working. In Kenya, it's working. Uganda, very soon. So all the information is out there. And this is working together in close partnership with UNCTAD. Harmonization of regulations improving NTB monitoring mechanism. Now, what we got to realize is that when you face a problem, how quickly do you get it to the authorities? So working with the countries, we supported a simple technology using SMS reporting to instantly report all these barriers. We have what we call the national monitoring committees where all the, all the major agencies are members, including the police, and tell you what, in terms of resolving, the police moves faster, much faster than the, gov the other government agencies, and we thought this would be the other way around. Increased private sector participation in decision making. Results, faster customs clearance of goods as a result of these uh, interventions. What we've seen, what used to take 21 days, moving goods from Mombasa to Kigali in Rwanda, a distance of about 1,680 kilometers, used to take 21 days in 2012. Today, it takes six days and going across three borders. K Mombasa to Kampala, 1,170 kilometers, used to take 18 days. Today, it takes four. And because the systems have been linked, Three documents reduced to one running through the whole chain. Enhanced end-to-end -end tra uh, efficiency, transparency, and accountability. This is through the automation of those other government agencies and the electronic single windows. Trade information portals, like I've mentioned. Establishment of the National Trade Facilitation Committees in all these countries, in the five ESC countries and improved uh, infrastructure at the borders. Now, Trademark has supported 
the construction of 13 one-stop border posts in the region and implemented coordinated border management procedures. Improved management of transit cargo. Now this is what I mentioned, the regional electronic cargo tracking. What we realize is that standalone systems were not delivering the service that we all wanted. And in terms of benefit, I need to mention here that ideally it was to stop diversion of transit cargo. But what do we realize is that in terms of benefit, it's both to the public and the private. I just want to give you an example that accidents which occur, for those of you who don't know, in many of our least developed countries, when a truck overturns and the goods pour out, you know what happens? The whole village descends on the truck and within 15 minutes, there's nothing on site. So as a result of this tracking and enforcement mechanism, the private sector has benefited quite a lot because between January and end of May, the record shows they were in Kenya alone, the main transit country because the goods are coming from Mombasa. There were 69 accidents. What was saved in terms of revenue to government was about $570,000. But in terms of value of goods, the benefit that went to the private sector was about $1.2 million. So who benefits more out of these initiatives? In many cases, it's the private sector. You have reduction in cost and time through capacity enhancement, regulatory harmonization, the reduction, average testing for standards, for example. We supported the enhancement of capacity of the testing capacity. The cost reduced by 59%. Previously, samples had to be sent to Europe and South Africa for testing. Time at the border out of harmonization because if you had a regional standard, that means there was no delay at the border. The time dropped by 99% of goods staying at the border. Reduced trade barriers, NTB resolution time from 24 months. 24 months is two years to eight months. It still sounds very long, but just imagine what that means, 67%. And more inclusive trade and consultative uh, decision making. and implementation of the AEO. So now moving forward, what we are doing now is having a regional scheme, harmonizing at the region so that there's mutual recognition. Once you're recognized in one country, the same treatment moves to the other. Just a pictorial of these are the, the, the monitoring centers for the regional electronic cargo tracking. Now, one is in Rwanda, the other in Uganda, and one in Kenya. These centers, read one another, and simultaneously they track. So wherever there is violation, that country intervenes. And it's seamless. It's really, it's transformed, revolutionized the whole, the way business is done. This is a pictorial of the one-stop border posts, big facilities. This last one is not yet operational between Uganda and South Sudan. We think very soon, this, by the end of this year, this will be operational. But Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, Tanzania, Uganda, and so 13 of them have been uh, implemented. In the processes, this is an example, the Food and Drug Authority that used to take two days, now takes two hours. The Tea Board of Kenya, that used to take eight days to give you a permit, now takes 1.5 days. Why? Pace of implementation. When we speak, it all sounds like TFA is a win-win. It's real. I think I'm running out of time. TFA is a win-win. But why on earth, if it's a win-win, why do we take a lot of time? Why doesn't it happen very quickly? But really, when you get to look at this, it's, there are enablers. Regional cooperation, strong private sector voice. Those are the enablers towards implementation of the Trade Facilitation Agreement and the other initiatives. What are the constraints besides capacity? Because we always talk about capacity, capacity, capacity to implement. We need money to implement. I would like to keep away from the capacity issue. I would like to talk about the other interests. 
that you meet, the vested interests among private and public players. The kind of perception that comes out is like the private sector wants facilitation, but government is blocking. Actually, private sector is sometimes part of the impediment to facilitation because of vested interest. We were at one forum where the government comes out and says, let's all agree. After this event, I don't want any member of the private sector to come to my office because in public, they support. When you get out, they come now to say, please go slow, stop, don't do that, don't do that. So that's a major element, the unwritten element that happens here. Use of trade as a source of revenue by government agencies. It's very common that fees from trade actually run budgets of some institutions. So when you talk about facilitation to avoid duplication and do mutual recognition that if the other country has done it, don't repeat, what comes first is what about the money that I was going to earn from this service? What do I do? At the border, if trucks are stopping once, where they used to stop and you collect parking fees, how do you do it? You'd rather they, they pay even without stopping so that you continue to maintain that service. I think those are some of the practical issues that we have found on the ground, which we really need to implement. And then slow domestication of the TF-related laws. But what we find is that the critical enabler here is political will. You really need strong political will to drive the trade facilitation agenda. And how do you get to sustain whatever you've done? One the example in East Africa, we have used regional legislation which cut across so you don't need to domesticate, you don't need to ratify, and then that happens quickly. Mainstreaming procedures in institutional policies, training so that they are part and parcel. It's no longer a project that is, has a timeline and closes and leaves. They are mainstreamed in there. Regional measurement. We get to realize that whatever gets measured gets improved. So if you don't measure, we, have develop, we are developing indices to measure performance of the borders and publish this and create some kind of competition among the agencies so that then they will be recognized and you incentivize efficiency, reward them, recognize them, and private sector driven change through the joint border committees, peer to peer learning. One is, for example, you support a team of women traders from one border take them to another for two days. Once they learn, they will be the pressure to exert change in the other one. And finally, finally, this is who does TFA serve? TFA serves the truck driver. TFA serves the government agency who is doing examination at the border. And finally and most important, TFA serves the small trader at the border. This woman trader, the 80%. So TFA should be inclusive, is inclusive, and this is what we all need to strive to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. And some of the uh, barriers that you mentioned, I recall hearing members when we were negotiating, when they were negotiating the trade facilitation agreement, mention the same thing, such as the roadblocks. And, and I, so I think that this is a problem bigger than just in East Africa. It's more broader around the world. And we've heard some very impressive statistics um, from all the speakers so far today. But um, I, I thank you for giving some specific examples of concrete benefits, because you've given us a clear sense of how the benefits are achieved and the impact of governments, traders, and consumers. And especially impressive when some of the times are going from weeks to mere days. But I was also very impressed at, at the uh, fast uh, cleanup time of an overturned truck. That was a very fast statistic as well. <laughs> so thank you very much. We will now um, move over to our last but not least, our speaker, um, Mrs. Lillian Boilia. Uh Lillian and I first met in French class many years ago. And some people think that the trade facilitation negotiations took a long time. I think my French progress is even slower. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Lillian used to be here as a first secretary in the Zambia mission here in Geneva, and she was a negotiator on the trade facilitation agreement. She is now back in Zambia, and she's the director of foreign trade at the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, and Industry. And she's now responsible for activities related to implementation of the trade facilitation agreement, amongst other things. 
And she's also a focal point for trade capacity building projects within the ministry, including with the Enhanced Integrated Framework. Have to mention that. So Lillian, many members are currently in the process of looking for support to implement their Category C measures. And there's a great deal of implementation support available from donors at the international level, the regional level, and bilateral level. Could you please share your experience in how developing and least developed countries are leveraging finances to implement the trade facilitation measures and how a member can ensure synergies and complementarity in the support received from the different partners? Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just run through what we have done as Zambia in terms of leveraging finances to implement the trade facilitation agreement or the trade facilitation measures. So maybe just to give a historic background as to why the technical assistance or support for implementation is required. So we do recall that the Annex D, which is the modalities for negotiations on trade facilitation, does make reference to the, import, the importance of trade uh, technical assistance. First, technical assistance in, the, in terms of engaging in the negotiations, but there's also language that speaks to implementation. And not just implementation of soft measures, but in limited uh, cases where you have hard infrastructure that is also recognized. So in terms of the agreement itself, when you look at the transparency provisions in Article 22, which talks about developed countries notifying um, what kind of assistance they are providing to developing and least developed countries, so you find it in that article. So in terms of Zambia and how we are leveraging finances, the, the, the starting point is what is it that a country has done towards implementation of the trade facilitation agreement. So in our case, we have ratified the agreement. This was done in 2015. We notified all our category A, B, and C in one notification. We have established a national committee on trade facilitation. We did preliminary costings of category C measures. And then we developed an implementation matrix and also the donor or cooperating partners also develop their own metrics to track their programs. And we've also established a, a government uh, donor platform. This has been established under assistance from the Enhanced Integrated Framework. So in terms of notified measures, those are the measures we've notified in terms of the categories B, C, so I'm just uh, looking at what we have done in terms of what comes under B and the C. So that's how our schedule looks like. And then in terms of uh, the costings, we did costings with the support of uh, the DFID. So a consultant was engaged, but those costings actually relate to additional work being done with consultancy work to actually now establish the real cost for each, of, each one of the measures. So we have those preliminary costings, which um, have been done. And then we have developed a, an implementation matrix. And this has been done and shared within the National Committee on Trade Facilitation, where each agency has looked at the metrics and have identified what kind of uh, uh, gaps require to be addressed so it is according to the articles and the issues, the challenges, and what measures should be undertaken. And it also gives the time frame through which those measures will be implemented. So that's um, now the development partner uh, metrics. So it identifies the, uh, the development partner, the program, whether it's regional or, or national, then the type of support. It also looks at uh, the budget as well as the measures within the trade facilitation agreement, what would be uh, facilitated. So that's the DFID um, uh, support and, and the measures. And then we have the USAID, the, 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 the measures that will be covered by the support that is being received from USAID. We have the European Union, we have different programs under the EU and the amounts that uh, attached to, it, to those programs, as well as the measures under the Trade Facilitation Agreement. 
We have the World Bank. We have a number of regional programs under the World Bank, including the measures that will be covered under the support from the World Bank. We have the German support, uh, the areas that are covered under the German support. And then we have the African Development Bank and also the measures that they are supporting. And in terms of the donor platform, which is the support that, uh, it's a platform that has been, it's, uh, this was recognized as part of the diagnostic trade integration study. So the idea is to bring the, the cooperating partners and, and the government to, to a table where they discuss implementation of the DTIS. And among the measures that have been identified under that DTIS is one of them is on trade facilitation. So this provides a platform where the, the, the cooperating partners will be able to uh, share the, the, the interventions that's uh, being undertaken and also government to also share the gaps in terms of what needs to be supported. So through this framework, it's easy for now the donor community or cooperating partners to know where the support is, create synergies in their, in their intervention so that there's no duplication. So you maximize the amount of uh, money that is there for government and to, to, to actually disaggregate to say, okay, if on this board I've got three cooperating partners and this is what they are doing, so how can they sequence their activities? So the platform facilitates that discussion. I think the last uh, meeting we had was on the 7th of June where we shared um, a monitoring report that has been done on one of the borders with Tanzania and Zambia or, and also another one between Zambia and Zimbabwe where we have highlighted the support that we have received under different donor um, support. And in that way, the, the, the cooperating partners are able to further have a further discussion on how they make sure that their support is sequenced and you get results for money. So this is how far we have gone as Zambia. It's been a short presentation, I hope, <laughs> within time. Thank you. Can I just ask you a quick question? What's the role of the National Trade Facilitation Committee in this process? So, so we, with the National Committee on Trade Facilitation, so it's like a technical committee that actually takes care of the implementation matrix. It uh, tracks the support that is received from the cooperating partners as well as the implementation process on the part of the different agencies. So when the committee meets, because under, under the committee there are subcommittees, and then above the committee we have a steering committee. So the, the national committee actually compiles all the technical interventions as well as the cooperating partner support, and then it reports to a higher committee, which is a steering committee, which is um, chaired by the secretary to the cabinet who then gives policy direction as to where the gaps are and what needs to be done at the technical level. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you very much. You know, with 30 possible provisions to be implemented of the agreement and multiple border agencies that will have to implement it, I'm, I'm sure it was a very difficult process. So it is very interesting and, and to hear your experience on how you went about it and how you reviewed to see how the, the gaps are filled. And, um, and particularly mentioning the importance of members completing their category Cs so they can approach donors and know what their needs are. So we have 10 minutes left. I will stop talking so that I can open the floor to anyone that has questions. Do we have any questions out there? Very back. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the interest in presentations. Uh, my name is Alina. I'm from International Trade Center, from Trade Facilitation Division there. So from, from our side, uh, we work a lot with the private sector. As per our mandate, we, we do work with private sector as well in trade facilitation. So we do a lot of private sector workshops where we're trying to raise awareness on trade facilitation, establish public-private dialogue, and also uh, help SMEs to advocate for efficient trade facilitation reforms. And at the same time, we work also on the policy level, trying to help implementing the reforms. 
So one of the challenges we see uh, now moving on to implementation phase of the agreement that the sustainability of trade facilitation reforms is something we really need to think about. For example, if we take trade information or trade facilitation portals, once they're established with the project money, with the help from the donors, and you have all step-by-step -step procedures which are really necessary for SMEs to know how they can export, but then once you have it, how do you make sure that this portal is maintained and updated by the agency in the country once the project is over? Because if it's only a short-term initiative, then the benefits on the long term won't be that visible. The same thing, for example, with the single window. Once you establish it, it's, even if it's running properly for the moment, how do you ensure that SMEs in the long term don't have problems with electricity, if they don't have problems with IT infrastructure, if they have limited access to these tools, how can they on the constant basis uh, use single window which is established for them? So I would be really interested to hear your views on the sustainability issue of trade facilitation reforms from your experience and from your work in the field. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think in one of the slides I talked about sustainability. It's a big issue. So what we've done in this case is mainstreaming whatever we are doing within the laws and within the budgets, working with the countries to mainstream these within the laws so that when this ends, when the project ends, whatever initiatives are already incorporated within the instruments, within the administrative instruments that these institutions use. And two, the private sector. Once you have a strong and vocal private sector, in East Africa, we have an advantage, is that we have what we call the East African Business Council, which brings the regional private sectors from the countries. And then at the national levels, you have very strong institutions who actually in all the countries have one engagement with the heads of state directly and raise their issues. So. Even if you dodge them the whole year, they'll have an event where they voice directly with the head of state and decisions are made at that point. So moving forward, we see that whatever step is achieved, it's very difficult to renege and move back. That's how, that's how it's been tackled, yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's, uh, that's really a very good point. I mean, it's, it's true, it's a very important issue. Uh, and um, I mean, on, one example I can give uh, is uh, on, on actually the trade facilitation monitoring aspect, right? Uh, there is a lot of um, a lot of the measures, the way they are implemented. A lot of the, it's done by international consultants. They come, they fly in, they do uh, their thing, and say, "Oh, tick the box, and it's implemented. It's done. The study is done. Everything is finished." Uh, and then you, uh, one year later, I mean, basically you go back and then actually you see that no progress has been made, no improvement in trade facilitation, nothing like this. Um, what uh, we've, we've been working with the Asian Development Bank on actually uh, monitoring uh, trade costs and, and trade facilitation. Uh, at the beginning, when we, we started doing this, uh, we, we were conducting one-time studies, you know, trade facilitation assessments. And then, uh, and then we realized that, uh, you know, we're doing this. And then after the study is done, maybe it is used, maybe it's not used. But then the government, six months later, has, has no idea about what's actually the current status of, uh, of trade facilitation uh, in their country. So we tried to develop something called the uh, uh, trade and transport facilitation monitoring mechanism. So instead of having international consultants come in and, and do studies and, and, uh, and calculate PKIs uh, and key, or KPIs, uh, key performance indicators uh, for the country, uh, we build the capacity uh, of a national team in uh, developing uh, it's a uh, trade facilitation monitoring mechanism. And so once the capacity is there at the national level, okay, some government officials are trained, uh, some local uh, research institutions are trained, then you, know, you build some amount of sustainability uh, because you've built the capacity at the national level instead of relying extensively on, 
on uh, international consultants. So that takes a lot more time uh, to do, a lot more efforts, uh, but I think there is no other ways to achieve some level of sustainability. So that's a very narrow example on, on monitoring aspect, but I think it applies also to other things. Thank you. If I may, I, I think these are all very valid points, but I, I can't underscore enough the importance of the National Trade Facilitation Committee. Um, I, I'm very pleased to hear the way Zambia has uh, set it up. The private sector has to be there, and also a leading figure in the administration that has overarching authority over the various government departments that are present at the border needs to be there in order to impart instructions. because. There are several risks in sustainability. In, in, one is that if you focus too much on customs, as, as someone said, the other agencies are going to say, well, it's none of my business then. Or the other way around. If, if you just put one of the agencies in charge but not customs, you might say, okay, well, that's for Food and Drug Administration. I, 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 I'm not concerned. Well, not true. So, so the structure and the functioning of the National Trade Facilitation Committee is very important. And I would venture one more thought, which is, this is not just for um, a, a determined shelf life until the TFA is fully implemented. It can go beyond, as, as Jan was saying. Think of TFA Plus or, or TFA V2 or, or whatever you want to call it. There's always a way to improve trade facilitation beyond the trade facilitation agreement of the, of the World Trade Organization, which is a, an excellent tool and a very first step. But if you look at the best single windows out there in the world, some of them are in version 4 or version 5, and they keep improving. So I think that's the, the mindset that needs to be built into the whole operation. Constant improvement through a strong uh, institutional architecture in the country that includes all agencies, people who have oversight over them, and participation from the private sector. Thank you very much. Now, if anyone's gotten over their shyness and has a very quick question, we have time probably for one more question. Yes. Merci pour la parole. Richard Mukunji, Arca Consortium. En dépit des avantages de la mise en œuvre de l'accord de facilitation des échanges, c'est l'aspect euh, coût de la mise en œuvre, surtout pour certaines dispositions, qui vraiment nécessite euh, une attention particulière pour euh, le PMA. Alors je voudrais, euh, pour les panélistes, qu'ils puissent voir de quelle manière, en tout cas, il serait important euh, pour les PMA euh, d'élargir les possibilités, c'est-à-dire complémentaires des financements, au-delà de, de ces mécanismes pour l'accord sur la facilitation des échanges qui est à l'OMC. Euh, autrefois, on parlait de l'aide pour le commerce, les partenaires publics privés, les financements nationaux et aussi les investissements euh, directs étrangers. Si vraiment avoir quand même un avis, parce que euh, les coûts sont là, exorbitants, surtout en termes d'infrastructure, de quelle manière, en tout cas pour les paiements, euh, comment on peut arriver à, à, à faire face à ces coûts Merci. Right. I think uh, one of the key things is some of the um, infrastructure, of course, comes with a cost. Um, but a lot of the implementation you can do on public-private partnerships, such as the Global Alliance, you don't need consultants on the ground that you have to pay for. You basically bring in the private sector experts from around the world. For example, we're in every country in the world except one. I have someone anywhere in the world who has local knowledge and they're local people. So you need to share that. And the other thing you need to look forward to is this is investment for the future. This is investment for profit. If you implement this, your economy will grow. This is a no brainer. But I agree with you, there is an infrastructure cost. But if you bring in the private sector properly, you use partnerships such as the Global Alliance and other facilities out there, you can implement mo the vast majority of these things without additional cost. Thank you. I think we're out of time. So thank you for the very succinct question and answer. And I'll just do a very, very fast uh, on-time delivery of a, of a quick wrap-up. Um, 
because we've heard about trade facilitation in LDCs from several different perspectives, and there were several, I think, key themes that we heard today and all the speakers, but these are also key themes that I hear whenever I am at a workshop on trade facilitation or at the committee meeting hearing members share their experience. So perhaps those are the most important to, to just say again. And first of all, we heard all across the board here that implementing the trade facilitation will bring results. You know, we heard lots of great statistics, lower time saving trade costs, impressive statistics. To achieve these results, political will is crucial. Also, border agency coordination is crucial, especially right now in the National Trade Facilitation Committees. It's very important that you have a, an effective, well-functioning committee right now to oversee implementation and donor support. Um, well, since we're out of time, I, I would just, I think those are perhaps, uh, oh, and I didn't mention, the committee also must include the, the private sector. So government coordination with private sector. Those are perhaps just the top bullet points uh, because I know you have a short uh, coffee break, but I also want to just also um, say that Lillian, the, you know, this is in trade facilitation. We haven't heard this uh, topic mentioned before, so uh, re welcome this new topic on how to manage donor support and hope other members will share their experiences in future trade facilitation committees. So uh, in closing, if you want more information on all the donor projects that are available, including the WTO, that's what all the tables are in the atrium. And uh, if you're on Facebook, they're all available on our website as well, so don't worry if you can't pick up the paper copy. Uh, just, I would like to ask you, um, before we close, uh, I mentioned the coffee is outside the room, then four o'clock, I think you're watching the World Cup on the big screens? Oh, no, no, sorry. It's <laughs> Talking Trade Strategies for Small Business Women and Growth <laughs> is here in four o'clock. Uh, so I just in closing, like to you to all give a, a big round of applause to our speakers today. So thank you very much.